안녕하십니까. 뇌를 사랑하는 신경외과 전문의 SS 조동찬 의학 전문 기자입니다. 뇌의 신호를 정확하게 알아차리면 우리는 기적을 만들 수도 있습니다. 지난해 브라질 월드컵 때 우리는 그 기적을 보았는데요. 하반신이 마비된 청년이 공을 차야겠다 이렇게 생각하자 로봇발은 그를 대신해서 축구공을 힘껏 찼습니다. 뇌의 신호를 정확하게 파악한 후그 신호대로 움직일 수 있는 로봇을 개발해온 미구의 니코렐리스 교수의 작품이었는데요. 110편이 넘는 논문을 통해 뇌를 구현하는 로봇가 있다는 걸 입증해온 니코렐리우스 교수가 신비한 뇌 세상 이야기를 여러분께 들려드릴 겁니다. 저도 무척 설렙니다. 네, 여러분 듀크 대학교 신경과학과 미겔 니코렐레스 교수를 큰 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. 굿 아프터눈, 땡큐 베리 마치. 퍼스트 오브 올라이 투 땡크 SBS 앤 에브리바디 인볼브 앤 데이 소프 디지털 포럼 포 디즈 인비테이션 이즈 그레이트 플레저 투 비 베크 인 코리아 투 토크 투유 아바웃 아이 스토리. And this morning we heard a beautiful talk about the universe above our heads. Uh, this afternoon I'd like to talk to you about the universe inside our heads. The true creator of everything that we see around us. Actually the true source of conscious, consciousness and curiosity. And to do that I'll tell you a story. And the story starts like this. Last summer, uh, during the opening ceremony of the Football World Cup, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, this young man, this young Brazilian that you see celebrating here, performed an amazing deed. Despite being paralyzed from mid-chest down, Juliano Pinto was able to deliver the opening kickoff of the World Cup on the sidelines of the match uh, field, where a few hours later, the Brazilian national team started playing. And Giuliano did that because he was capable of basically using his brain activity alone to command the first robotic vest that, be, can, that can be controlled by the brain activity of a subject. More than that, that vest can deliver back to that subject a tactile sensation when the subject walks under the command of his own brain. And I wanted to tell you the story how we got there and what was necessary to actually make a paralyzed man walk again. This started with an idea that was considered pretty crazy 15 years ago, and that is when my good friend John Shapin and I created a paradigm that we named Brain Machine Interface. And the idea was basically exactly what the name says. Let's record electrical signals from many parts of the brain because we know the motor commands are encoded by electricity in the brain. And let's try to extract these signals from the brain and basically use digital computers and a little bit of mathematics to translate these signals into commands that a machine can understand. And in doing so, create a machine that can move under the command of the subject's own brain activity. More than that, if we sensorize this machine, John and I thought, we could send feedback information back to the brain so that the brain would actually learn what is going on when this machine moves in space. Well, for about 12 years, we basically introduced and implemented concepts related to brain-machine interfaces in animals. We use monkeys to test some of our ideas. And what you're going to see here is a short video showing one monkey using its own electrical brain activity to move an avatar arm without moving his own body and explore virtual objects with a virtual hand. And because this animal is capable of touching these uh, objects in virtual space, and because we are sending a signal from this avatar hand directly back to the brain of the animal, he was able to discriminate the texture of these objects by using a virtual hand to touch them without moving his own, uh, its own body. And that's what this monkey is doing here. In the background, you're going to listen to the brain of the animal making the decision to actually move this arm. And as the arm is touching the surface of the ob objects, every time you touch it, 
an electrical signal is delivered back to the brain so that the monkey can learn what is the texture of the object he has to press. And if he press the correct object, as you see with the label correct, the monkey gets a drop of orange juice as a reward. And every monkey will do anything for you if you give them a drop of orange juice. So these monkeys learn to perform these tasks and do very amazing tricks using a direct connection between the brain and a device. Well, next, when we saw these results, we immediately proposed in 2000 in a series of articles, John and I, that perhaps if we had a patient that had suffered a lesion of the spinal cord and the electrical commands generated in the head could not any longer reach the muscles of the body, that's the reason the patient is paralyzed, as you see in the diagram on the left, we knew by then that the brain of the patient continues to generate the electrical brain storms coding motor commands. So the idea we proposed in 2000 is let's create an electronic computational bypass, let's read these signals in real time, extract the motor commands digitally, and then send this to a new body, a robotic body that the patient is going to wear. And let's see if the patient can regain mobility by controlling this vest just mentally. As you can imagine, in 2000, that idea was considered pretty outlandish, pretty crazy, and people thought that we needed help of the psychiatric variety. But it turned out that the concept was sound and the theory behind worked. So what I'm going to show you is how a bunch of scientists around the world, more than 100 scientists, technicians, engineers, Neuro rehab personnel, physicians, and a lot of people work together from 25 different countries, five continents, for 12 months, uh, I'm sorry, 18 months, around the clock, to actually build a robotic vest, an exoskeleton, that could be controlled by the brain activity of paralyzed people, and also deliver back to these patients a sense of touch. Every time the exo touches the ground, we wanted our patients to experience this as a realistic experience. Well, this is the exoskeleton. It's named after a very famous Brazilian scientist who actually created the concept of con uh, control flight. Uh, Brazil Santos Dumont 1 is an electrical hydraulic machine. It has 15 degrees of freedom that can be controlled. It has about seven gyroscopes that help balance the entire device. And more important than that, it has a central processing unit right here on the top that is actually on the back of the patient, like a backpack, that allows brain signals coming from the subject's brain to be decoded in real time, transforming digital commands and deliver to the actuators of the machine so that the patient can control the movement of the device and at the same time receive feedback. The reason we can provide feedback to these patients is because of the ingenuity of one of my best friends, Gordon Sheng, a professor of robotics at the Technical University of Munich, who created this thing called artificial skin. Basically, Gordon realized that he could embed pressure, temperature, and proximity sensors on very flexible printed circuit boards, and they, he could daisy chain these circuit boards and then basically place the whole arrangement into 3D printed plastic material to create what he called an artificial skin. And because he created this uh, in great big patches, we could actually apply these patches, for instance, to the surface of the foot of our exoskeleton. This is an example of a regular uh, foot here, a regular sandal, showing to you what happens when the sensors are applied to the ground. You can see the pressure signals appearing there on the computer. Well, every time the exoskeleton walks under the control of our patient's brain, basically these signals are generated and are delivered almost immediately to the forearm skin of these patients in both arms. So we created what we call a haptic display to deliver feedback from the fit directly to the skin that the patients still have sensitivity on. So we fool the brain to actually feel the feedback from the feet using the skin of the arms. And we found the correct combination of parameters, the spatial temporal waves of delivery of this feedback, so that the brain of these patients, and we know because the patients told us, 
actually create the illusion that these patients have legs and feet again, what is called a phantom limb sensation. Every one of the eight patients that we trained with this device were able to walk and actually have the perception that they were walking with their own legs, even though they couldn't move their legs because they are paralyzed. So let me show you one of the examples of how this happened. I'm moving my slides too quick. Here's a movie of the first day one of our patients walked with the exoskeleton. You can see that he's using, wearing a helmet. That's because he's wearing an uh, electroencephalograph cap that reads his brain signals and broadcasts it to the central processing unit of the exoskeleton so that he can control the movements of the device. So when you see now a blue light in front of his head is the signal that he took the correct mental decision to actually move the exoskeleton. That's the first day he learned to walk. Again, after nine years on a wheelchair, that was the first day this former athlete had the experience of actually walking by himself again. In every one of these steps, he's touching the ground and he's feeling the ground on his forearms. So he's creating an image, a, a tactile image of the ground below the exoskeleton. And that is very important because it gives not only the possibility of moving, but the sense of moving himself. This changes the whole game uh, when you talk about rehabilitation of the patients. Here is uh, Giuliano Pinto in one of the tryouts for the World Cup kickoff. Uh, Giuliano gave 56 kicks in the soccer stadium where the uh, opening ceremony happened. He got 56 correct, which is much more than the Brazilian team got in that World Cup, I can tell you. But what you're going to see is just the same thing that we did on the pitch. The lights you're going to see gives you a message how the brain machine interface works. Basically, when the blue lights start pulsating, you, you know that the exoskeleton is ready to receive the mental signals from the brain of Giuliano to move. When you see two flashes of light, green and yellow, moving from the helmet to the legs, it's because Giuliano took the correct decision to kick the ball, and then you see uh, basically the kick being produced. So it took about 22 seconds for Giuliano to perform this task. You can see that he took the right mental decision now, and now the exo is going to move, and he's going to kick the ball. The most moving thing I heard after this moment in the pitch, after one billion people saw this on TV very briefly, was Giuliano screaming to us as he celebrated this as a goal that he had felt the ball. He really felt the contact with the ball, which is for a person that has been nine years in a wheelchair after a car accident, something that changes your life. Because the changes we saw in Giuliano and the other patients' lives is not only related about motion, is also related about something systemic in their clinical well-being. Everything in the body of these patients improved because they could now walk an hour a day. I'm going to show you just something very remarkable that we noticed uh, at the end of one year of training with the patients. Basically, this is another patient with a complete spinal cord injury. After one year of training with the exoskeleton that you saw, we did a neurological check in this patient, and we saw this. She was moving. She regained mobility of muscles below the level of the lesion, to a point where if you suspend her from the ceiling and ask her to move again, she can move her legs a little bit. She can actually simulate locomotion movements, very likely because her brain changed. There was a plastic reorganization in the brain, and this was transmitted to the spinal cord to probably a few nerves that were still there and allowed her to move her own legs for the first time since her lesion. Well, I have just a few minutes to tell you that this is just the beginning. These uh, brain machine uh, interface examples, clinical examples, mark the beginning of a new era of what I like to call the brain actuating technology era, where we are going to see in a new near future, a variety of applications that not only paralyze patients, but we all will be able to use brain-derived signals to control our computers, to control our cars, perhaps even to send uh, text messages or emails and communicate. 
And to demonstrate this future, I just want to finish to show the latest edge on the field, a paper that is going to come out in a few days, and you're probably going to hear about it in the press, because this is the first example of what we call the brain net. And the brain net is the first shared brain machine interface. And to demonstrate this concept, we use three monkeys that basically collaborate mentally in real time, without moving their bodies, to move a virtual arm in three-dimensional space. Basically, since you have X, Y, and Z to move, we got one monkey to control X and Y, the other monkey to control Y and Z, and the third monkey to control X and Z. And we digitally combine their brains to the point in which they were able to actually do these tasks together. You see two monkeys here playing the game. You see the virtual arm. This monkey is controlling, the left one is controlling X and Y. This monkey is controlling Y and Z. There is a third monkey in another room. And you see that the monkeys have a visual feedback only of the dimensions they are controlling. And by using these dimensions, they are getting a synchronization with a millisecond resolution of the three brains. And they can only perform the task correctly if they actually do that. And when they do that, what we saw, because we give a reward to them and each one at the end of the trial, is that their brains are maximizing the representation of the two axes in space that they are representing and reducing the representation of the axis that some other monkey is doing. So we can basically shift the representations of the world and we can show that the brain is acquiring statistics that we are telling the brain to acquire in order to cooperate in a medium that is basically driven by electrical brainstorms coming from these three brains simultaneously. So I'd like to finish by saying that we are seeing just the beginning of this. We are going to expand the interactions between human and machines in a way that humans will take advantage of machines to improve the quality of life or to do things that we couldn't do before. Machines will not take over ever of our humanity, but we will use machines to become more human. Thank you.